Turkey's Prime Minister Ahmet Davutoglu has accused the Syrian-based Kurdish YPG militia of being behind Wednesday's deadly bombing in Ankara. Davutoglu named the perpetrator as Saleh Nechar, a Syrian national and member of the YPG People's Protection Units. Fourteen people have been arrested in connection with the attack, Davutoglu added. I won't give details now on where they come from and how they were organized, but we have all the information and will share it with all countries. I'll give the order to the foreign ministry today to distribute all related documentation, giving priority to the P5 Security Council countries. We'll show those who say the YPG is not a terrorist organization, then we expect to receive indisputable solidarity in return. He insisted that the faction is a terrorist group. Last week, Turkey lashed out at the U.S. for refusing to recognize the YPG's political wing, the PYD Democratic Union Party, as an extremist organization. Turkey's president, Recep Tayyip Erdogan, insists the PYD is involved in the Ankara bombing, despite its denials. The party's leader, Saleh Muslim, claims instead that Turkey is trying to escalate the fighting in northern Syria. 27 of the 28 who died in the Ankara bombing were soldiers. Dozens more were injured. In a separate incident this morning, at least six soldiers were killed in an explosion appearing to target a military convoy in the predominantly Kurdish southeast. There's widespread agreement across the Turkish press that the Ankara blast was a direct attack on the country and that so-called foreign powers are to blame. It comes as Turkey is becoming increasingly embroiled in the war in neighboring Syria and the fiercest violence in decades in its Kurdish region. Everybody's scared, this woman says. On Wednesday night, we saw that fear in everyone's eyes. People were escaping from the explosion instead of going there out of curiosity. We can't stay in crowds, we can't stay in crowded places. We're not as comfortable as we were before. This is a game played by foreign powers against our country, this man says. Now it's high time to stand in solidarity. Nobody's in a position to criticize the others. I believe that we will rise above this together, but I'm very sad. No group has claimed responsibility for the attack, but the leader of the YPJ's political wing, the Syrian Kurdish Democratic Union Party, says it had nothing to do with the blast. U.S. President Barack Obama is to pay a historic visit to Cuba in the coming weeks, a senior administration official has said. The White House is to officially announce the trip, which will form part of a tour of Latin America, on Thursday. Obama's visit will mark the conclusion of his efforts to restore relations with the island nation following half a century of tensions. It will be the first visit by a sitting U.S. president in 88 years. In December 2014, Obama and Cuban leader Raul Castro surprised the world when they announced they'd held secret negotiations to thaw relations between the two countries, beginning with the resumption of full diplomatic ties. British Prime Minister David Cameron is in Brussels for the most crucial summit of his premiership. He needs a deal on his controversial reforms, including welfare curbs, or Britain could be voting to leave in a referendum back home. But European Council President Donald Tusk has warned all 28 leaders in a letter in constructive today. One person who's given an indication to German lawmakers that she is sympathetic is Chancellor Angela Merkel. Cameron's demands are far from being demands that are just for Britain. In some cases, we must say, they're quite the opposite. Many issues are issues that are justified and necessary. But a possible Brexit is not the only issue. There's migration. Last week, EU ministers gave Greece an ultimatum of three months to fulfill 50 recommendations to fix its borders. If it doesn't, Schengen's own countries will impose their own checks on internal frontiers. 
Migrants, most of them refugees from Syria, are still arriving on Greece's shores, although recently in fewer numbers, Athens says. Just hours before EU leaders meet in Brussels to discuss the issue, the government announced the opening of four migrant reception centres on some of its islands near Turkey. It may not satisfy the rest of the EU, however, who had demanded that Greece open five centres by the end of last year. Touring one registration centre, the Greek defence minister's message was clear. The message is uh, that we are ready. We are ready and uh, we are ready to receive with all, all the international procedure and law of the European Union, of uh, UNCR, uh, the refugees to make the registration. Greece has been accused of allowing many migrants to pass through its borders unfingerprinted and undocumented. And partly because of that, the EU's passport-free Schengen zone, one of the main principles of the Union, is now in jeopardy. The UN has confirmed that aid convoys with food and medical supplies for almost 100,000 people have made it through to five besieged towns in Syria. But it wants more access, estimating it needs to help nearly half a million people in around 15 besieged areas and over four and a half million people in other hard to reach areas. On the map are four of the seven towns which the Syrian government have finally allowed the UN to access. The UN's humanitarian coordinator in Syria gave more details. Today we're delivering aid to huge numbers of civilians, 42,000 people in Madaya and Bikane, 20,000 people in Kefraya and al Fua in Idlib province, as well as 30,000 people in Muadamiya. All these deliveries are happening at the same time. This convoy reached Madaya near the border with Lebanon but not before dozens starved to death after months of siege by government forces and their allies. In all, 250,000 people have been killed in five years of fighting. People in Uganda are voting in a presidential election in which all sides accuse each other of stoking tensions, violence and fraud. The incumbent, Yoweri Museveni, who's been in power for three decades, is seeking a fourth term in office. He's widely credited in the country as a force of economic stability and relative peace. But his opponents have been using their campaigns to call for change and fresh leadership. Museveni's longtime rival, opposition candidate Kiza Bizegi, has pledged to boost employment and tackle corruption. He's also warned of violent protests saying he doesn't expect Museveni to leave quietly. The other leading candidate is former Prime Minister Amama Mbazi, who until recently was a close ally of Museveni. He's been trying to appeal to the youth vote. Given the size and enthusiasm of crowds at opposition rallies, the election is expected to be the closest contest in decades. <laughs> Pope Francis has ended his Mexico visit along the U.S. border. There he prayed at a memorial for migrants who have perished trying to reach the United States. Against this backdrop, he denounced immigration policies which force many into the hands of drug gangs and people smugglers, and he remembered the plight of migrants everywhere. We cannot deny the humanitarian crisis that, in the last years, has meant the migration of thousands of people by train, on the road, or even on foot, crossing hundreds of kilometers of mountains, deserts, inhospitable roads. This human tragedy that is the forced migration nowadays and is a global phenomenon. Earlier, Francis had urged an end to the cycle of violence in a speech to prisoners in one of the most notoriously violent jails in Mexico, in the city of Ciudad del Suarez. For at least one of the 3,000 inmates, it was an emotional experience. President Pena Nieto was on hand to give Pope Francis a send-off as his tour to Mexico came to an end. It's been one in which the Pope has visited some of the most marginalized areas of a diverse country.